Hi. <clears throat> Hi, friends. This is Annie Grace, and I am answering readers' questions. Today I have a question from a girl. I'm going to call her Kay to protect her privacy. But uh, what's happening is every single day, you know, she has this incredible resolve not to drink. And then by the end of the day, it's almost overwhelming, this desire that drinking is going to make her happy and feel better. And despite all her conscious intentions, she just cannot understand why she finds herself drinking every single night and why she just so desperately wants to be drinking every single night um, and why it feels just like such deprivation and heartbreak not to be drinking. So she asked recently, she said, can somebody please give me the, the concise scientific reason that this is happening in my brain, that despite my best efforts and intentions, I just cannot put down the drink at the end of the night and I can only go a few days at a time. Um, so I have a few, a few things and I'm going to try to make this as, as simple but thorough as possible. So there's, there's three main points I want to make on this one. First of all is this idea of, of dopamine. And so we generally know about dopamine because we think things like exercise release dopamine, things like um, pleasure releases dopamine. And so for a long time, scientists actually thought that dopamine was the chemical that made you like something and enjoy something. But actually more recent studies have shown that dopamine is the chemical that motivates us and has us seek things, but isn't necessarily tied up with actually enjoying things. So there's a big difference between wanting something and actually enjoying something. So your desire, and when you were first drinking, um, you probably had a glass of wine and you wanted it, you desired it, and then certain things happen when you drink a glass of wine that we'll get into, and they release certain chemicals in your brain, and so you enjoyed it too. So wanting and liking were together, but what happens over years and years of drinking is that wanting and liking actually become separated. And so you can really want something you don't even like. I remember this was true in my drinking days. I desperately wanted a drink at the end of the day. It felt like I would be just miserable if I didn't have a drink and it was the key to my happiness, but I didn't even like it. Even after the first drink or two, I remember doing voice memos to myself or taking videos of myself or journaling being like, ah, just like, I don't even like it anymore. So I couldn't understand what was happening. So. If you think of dopamine, dopamine evolved to help us survive. So if you think of cavemen, for instance, cavemen were going along and say they were um, trying to find a, a spring. So they were trying to find some water source. And so they were walking through the woods or something and they found water. And what happened was there was a huge rush of dopamine. And the interesting thing about this is that it imprints what's happened just before that discovery and just after so that it will happen again. And that's one of the most amazing things about the human brain. So actually your brain backs up and your brain imprints, okay, when I found this water, what did the terrain look like just before then? What was the soil like? All these things happen subconsciously, right? And so you learn how to find water in the future and eventually cavemen become more and more adept at finding water sources and they don't understand why, they just suddenly know very unconsciously what sort of things to look for. And that's because when you have a dopamine rush, it imprints all the things that happen before that dopamine rush happened. And the dopamine is released when you find water and that makes you highly motivated to find water in the future. It's a reward. It's the same thing that happens in like target practice releases dopamine. Um, and so with drinking and, and addiction, what happens is you feel the things right before you have that thing imprint. And so you actually, this learning mechanism that's evolutionary and biological makes you learn that a drink is going to be the thing that you're looking for. And here's why, is because when you actually have that drink, something in the chemical composition of alcohol and any addictive substance releases and artificially stimulates a part of your brain called the nucleus accumbens. And this part of your brain is the part that's pleasure. So it makes you feel pleasure at this artificially high level. Now here's, that sounds great on the surface, but here's what's absolutely terrifying about that, is that your brain is a very delicate organism and it's always trying to maintain homeostasis. So this alcohol will release the pleasure chemicals at this artificially high level, and then your brain will come in and try to balance it out. 
So there's, you know, it releases things like endorphins, they make you feel good. And then your brain actually releases a chemical called Kreb, which is a precursor for something called dynorphin, which is the opposite of the endorphin. So it balances it out. So there's a few things that happen here. Number one is you build a tolerance. So over time, you release more of this chemical, more dynorphin gets released in your brain, and it goes up and up and up to the point where you need huge amounts of alcohol just to feel that same level of pleasure. The other thing that happens very unfortunately is you stop feeling pleasure from other areas in your life because when you're not releasing the alcohol, there's so much dynorphin if you're drinking on a daily or regular basis that like the normal things that used to bring you a lot of pleasure don't register anymore. And so the only thing that makes you feel good when you're drinking regularly becomes alcohol. And this is what people report. They report they can't even find pleasure or enjoyment in life unless they're drinking. And this is why you need a break that's long enough to allow your body to really heal. And um, the, the amount of time it takes is, is different for people depending how long they've been drinking. But just understand this fact that as soon as you release the artificial stimulation of your pleasure center, your brain compensates for it. And in order for that compensation becomes kind of ever present. And that's kind of how tolerance is built. And then there's a third thing that happens in your brain. And this is a very abbreviated sort of summary, but I'm trying to make this as, as succinct as possible. Um, and the third thing that happens in your brain is that alcohol actually damages your prefrontal cortex. And this happens when you're drinking. This is why after one or two drinks, it's much harder for you to resist the third or fourth. There's a lot of reasons for that. But one of them is because the alcohol itself actually impairs the part of your brain that is responsible for making just good decisions. That's your prefrontal cortex. It's the human thinking part of your brain, as opposed to kind of the reptilian part of your brain that's just acts on in instinct. And it's that reptilian instinctual part of your brain that has developed the need for alcohol through, again, the dopamine learning process. So alcohol actually also damages your prefrontal cortex ongoing. So if you've been drinking regularly over years, in general, your prefrontal cortex will be impaired. And so it'll be harder for you to make decisions kind of in the moment uh, anyways about alcohol. So really there's three things happening here, right? So alcohol increases your wanting, but not your liking by releasing these huge amounts of dopamine. And eventually, because so much dopamine is released over time, your brain um, retracts some of its dopamine receivers so that you need more and more alcohol to even get the same kind of to fulfill the craving. That's because your brain has been so bombarded by this rush of dopamine that happens through drinking that it, it actually takes away dopamine receivers. So they see this in very severely chemically dependent drinkers. They don't have as many dopamine receivers. They can't feel that kind of instinctual craving as, as much. I mean, they feel the craving, obviously, very strongly, but they don't feel kind of the other things that come with a dopamine release, the things that are the things that keep us um, the, the liking part that goes away completely. And you're just stuck with the wanting. So. Alcohol will increase the cravings, but not the pleasure. So the wanting and liking become separate with dopamine. Second is alcohol is going to artificially stimulate the pleasure center of your brain. That's the nucleus accumbens. Your brain is going to try to compensate for that overstimulation, and that leads to tolerance and the eventual numbing of this pleasure center, meaning that the reason that you feel so desperate to have a drink is because your brain has become um, numb to you have such a high level of these other counter chemicals that your brain is actually numb to uh, other pleasures and you have to reverse that and the best way to reverse that is by taking a break and detoxing from alcohol and then finally alcohol damages your prefrontal cortex so in that moment when you are feeling this intense craving and when you're feeling this need for something that releases pleasure and nothing else is doing it because of the tolerance your prefrontal cortex, that part of your brain that makes good decisions, is damaged, making it very, very difficult to resist a drink. So if you're in this situation where you're just finding it absolutely impossible to resist a drink, I would suggest actually talking to your doctor and seeing because there are different medicines that can help. And the, the thing about medicines that can help if you can't get out of this yourself the best thing is just to be able to take a break from alcohol and really reverse your thinking around it and understand what's happening. Because when you understand what's happening, you can see it kind of objectively and say, okay, this is happening inside my brain. This is very intense. And I, but I understand 
that these feelings aren't really, you know, true. And it isn't that alcohol is the only thing that's going to ever bring me pleasure again. It's that I need to recalibrate my brain to feel normal, natural pleasure. But if you can't do that, then going to see somebody about a prescription for something can really be helpful. And I've had a lot of readers report that this is helpful. And here's why, because there's nothing that's going to give you a confirmation of your beliefs or undo your unconscious conditioning, like your own experience. So there's actually a, um, a medication called naltrexone and naltrexone. What it does is it, it kind of chemically stops this. So it makes it so that that artificial stimulation isn't happening. And so you actually, in the moment of that drink, you don't feel any of the reward and pleasure. And I haven't used it myself, but people who are my readers who have used it report that if you're in this thing where you can't get past a day or two and you try something like naltrexone, suddenly you're able to break this pattern and take this break and understand what's happening without all of these chemical things happening. And so I'd, I'd certainly like, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a medical professional, but talking to your doctor about something like naltrexone might be really, really interesting. And I'm planning to have um, a woman named Claudia. She has done uh, amazing documentary. It's called one little pill. And I highly recommend you, you watch or read it if this applies to you. And this is like, Oh, I might want to try something like that. Um, I'm going to have her on my podcast and just kind of talk to her about what this is and do a deep dive into this. Because I think in some situations we can mentally overcome it because we understand it. And then in other situations, we might need some help to to really break up what's happening chemically in the brain. And so I think that there's um, definitely place for both of those, both of those things. So anyway, it's a really good question. I, I realize it's a complicated answer, but hopefully it helps. Um, it helps. So thanks so much, Kate. I really appreciate it.